start. And I want, yeah, I want this one first. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna want this guy Cliff uh, Neckle Neckle. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Fantastic. He's like an open air preacher apologist. He talks to kids on campuses all the time. Really, really good stuff. Um, and he'll illustrate the the point that we're gonna go over today. All right, so we have this three step game plan called the Columbo method. Oh, there's black. And so, excellent. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Uh, three step plans. So, step one gather. Oh. All right, and our model question is the one that we went over the last couple of weeks. You guys remember what that is? What do you mean by that? What? You. All right, that's our first question. So remember, we're just gathering information. We're not committed to anything yet, right? We're just trying to understand what the other person is claiming, trying to understand. Uh, this helped me when I was talking to a guy. He was from Fairbanks, uh, first time I met him. And uh, at, he was at breakfast on the last day at the men's retreat. <clears throat> and we were just talking. And now I've forgotten his name, so that's awesome. Anyways, I, I could see his face right in my mind right now. Um, anyways, uh, we were talking, and I was like, yeah, you know, there's, there's different traditions on, on uh, kind of on preaching and going through the Bible. And I'm like, the Baptist tradition is, is less structured, typically. And there can be some downsides to that. And I was like, uh, you, get, you go to a... You go to a church that has a liturgy and they're going to have like there's a book in the back of the pew that you open up and it's like word for word what's going to happen that Sunday. And there's what the priest or the pastor is going to say. There's the part that you're going to say, like it's all structured out <clears throat> and it's all right there. And if you go to that church for three years, you will have heard preaching from every part of the Bible. They go through, like the liturgy is set up to go through every part of the Bible. You'll hear everything. And he was like, yeah, you know, that's, you know, and I'm like, the benefit is you get the whole Bible. He goes, yeah, but you sh really should be feeding yourself. Like if it, if the only time you're eating, you know, reading the Bible is when you go to church, you're malnourished. And I was like, that's absolutely right. That was not quite the point I was trying to make. The point I was trying to make is that in the Baptist tradition, pastors can get on their hobby horses and avoid parts of the scripture that are difficult. And that's more common in the Baptist tradition. And he was like, I absolutely agree. You're right. And I was like, but what he, what he heard me say was one thing. And then he told me what he thought I was saying. And I was like, mm, that wasn't quite it. It was, I was actually trying to make this point. And he was like, oh, yeah, we agree. I was like, oh, good. Yeah, we agree. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but it took a little bit of conversation. It took a few questions to get, like, gather information. Like, gather information. That's the first step. So you understand the other person's view. It helps you know what the other person thinks. The model question again, what do you mean by that? <clears throat> step two, this is... Uh, this is what we're doing today, what we're starting on today. Uh, Kokel, in his book, calls it the burden of proof. Uh, what I want to call it is... ...on who has to give... Be clear on who has to give reasons. So many times you might get into a conversation with somebody and you hear them make an assertion and you might feel like you have to prove them wrong. You don't have to. You don't. If they make an assertion, they have to give reasons for why they're right. You don't have to give them reasons 
for why they're wrong. Again, this is a step-by-step -step process. We're still just gathering information. And the, what we're trying to do is we're still seeking to understand the reasons for their view. It helps you to know why they think their belief is true or why they think they're right, why they think the way that they do. And what Coco calls this is cursing burden of proof. he calls it. So if you make an assertion, you have the burden of providing reasons for that assertion or opinion or, you know, whatever you want to call it. So if you make a claim, you should have reasons to back up that claim. Now, <clears throat> if you listen to, you know, internet atheists and stuff, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the late Christopher Hitchens was he did this all the time. Uh, what he would do is he would say, atheists do not have the burden of proof when it comes to uh, the existence of God. The theist is claiming that there's this being that exists. And so you need to provide reasons for why you think that being exists. The atheist position is not making a claim. You can't make a claim that something can't positively claim that something doesn't exist. So here you go. The burden of proof, all on the theist. Now, if the claim is God exists, he's actually right. Positing a claim, you should have reasons for why you believe God exists, or Jesus is God, or the resurrection is true. Like, you should have reasons for why you believe that's true. So in that way, right. What he's not saying, really clever, that he has his own worldview that he purports to be true. He needs to provide reasons for why he thinks that's true. He's assuming that that's the starting point, his own worldview. And then goes, yeah, that's just the starting point. I don't have to prove anything. It's already assumed. Oh, wait a second. You believe that there's just material stuff. Please explain why there's consciousness. What is consciousness? The hard problem of consciousness. Why do we think that there's this moral reality? Can't touch that. Well, if you can't touch it, taste it, you know, test it, is it real? Well, according to his worldview, no. That seems to be a big problem for your worldview. Now let's argue about that. So, but all of that is like deep in the background, right? And he just, no, 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 I don't have the burden of proof. No, he says no. Um, so, vocal cause this the reversing of the burden of proof. <clears throat> the model question. How? Oh. At? Illusion. How did you come to that conclusion? There's a lot of different ways you could ask this question. It could be, oh, why do you say that? Like, give me, give me some more. What evidence do you have for this, right? What are the reasons for holding that view? And this could be for anything. I know we're in the kind of the context of trying to share our faith with other people, so it might be, you know, but this could be in any conversation. And you do this all the time. You probably just don't realize it. Uh, what I'm, I'm pointing out, what we, what we do. And then by doing that, hopefully we can recognize certain things when they happen. Uh, you could say, what are your reasons for holding that view? What makes you think that that's the right way to see it? Right? If you're in any kind of like meeting people and you're trying to decide what to do, you're going to end up giving reasons for why you think you should do something a certain way. Or not. What are those reasons? You're asking, how did you reach that conclusion? Kind of the same thing. Why would that idea seem so compelling to you? And, and notice when you throw that question at them, now they have to provide the reasons. Now, if they don't have any reasons, then it's a pretty short conversation. But 
If they have some reasons, then you can learn more information. And then the, then the, the debate or the discussion swirls around whether those are good reasons, that conclusion, or not. That's where, you know, sparks fly, as it were. But there's two main points that I want you to take away from today. First, the person who makes the claim, the person who makes the claim has the job of defending that claim. That's point number one. The person who makes the claim has the job of defending that claim. Second, it's not your responsibility to prove them wrong. It's kind of the, like for them, they need to provide reasons. For you, you don't have to prove them wrong. At least in this step of the plan. The next step we'll get to, and it's like, oh, let me ask some leading questions to show you how that doesn't really work or how your thinking is, is off in this way. And we'll get to that another time. But we're still trying to gather information. Uh, Kokel in his book, I'm going to quote him on page 65, it says, Reversing the burden of proof is not a trick to avoid defending our own ideas. When we give opinions, we have to answer for them just like anyone else. We have the responsibility, but so do they. That's my point. So press the person to give reasons for why they believe what they believe. So some examples. Uh, let's, so someone makes a claim and then you ask them, well, how did you reach that conclusion or something like that? <clears throat> so from, from a non-theist, or here, let's start off with a, a more common, something, you know, more common example. The Matrix is the best movie ever made. That's a claim, right? Whoa. <laughs> Oh, exactly. Oh, contraire. Oh, All right. All right. Matrix is the best movie ever made. All right. Came out in 1999 when many, many great movies came out. I mean, go look at that year for movies. Great year for movies. It developed technology that is still trying to be copied and can't be copied as good as it did in 1999. You watch that movie today, it still holds up. It illustrates really difficult philosophical ideas super well. The kung fu fighting is some of the best, bar none. And it's a Christ metaphor. The whole movie is a Christ metaphor. All right, see? I just gave like six reasons why it's the best movie ever made. But that's all, that's all you get. It's like, oh, really? Or why do you think that? Say what? Fantastic. And, oh, well, I mean, compared to, well, I mean, if we're just going by box office, man, I guess highest box office, well, it was Avatar for a while, but it was, it was Titanic first, yeah, and then Avatar overtook it, and then, uh, you know, it was probably Endgame, probably what, because everybody wanted to see how it ends, and then it just racked up the box office. But box office success is not the only reason for... All right, you know, that's, that's one, okay, fair point. However, where's the Kung Fu, all right? I want to see Kung Fu. I want to see Keanu Reeves go, Kung Fu. And then, yeah, and then Lawrence Fishburne goes, show me. And then they're in a dojo fighting, and it's amazing. Well, I, I love that movie. So besides that, that movie changed my life as a 12-year-old. Yeah, how are you going to argue against that reason? Uh, personal. Oh. <laughs> right, so I'm just trying to illustrate. We do this all the time, right? People make a claim, and then you give reasons for why, you know, to support that claim. That's what you're supposed to do. So the Bible is the word of God. That's a claim. Right? So, claim. Bible is the word of God. And a, a good way to illustrate what we're doing here is to think of got the roof, 
Ruth is your conclusion. What supports the roof? False. False. Um, all right, so these all are your reasons, evidence, fact, talking about. It's, it's all of those things. So, claim. Bible. The word of God. That's your claim. That's your that's your conclusion. Right? That's your claim. And then someone goes, How'd you reach that conclusion? So what are your walls? With this testimony? Testimony, like someone's personal testimony. Uh, what would that testimony be? The life experience interacting with it. That we, okay. Life experience. Uh, when you interact with the word. It like proved itself to you personally that it was the word of God because it affected you in in a way that other books don't. Or you said, okay, yeah, life experience. So this could be personal, or what would be the word for yeah, observe? Bible's the word of God. Why do you believe that? Historical accuracy. <laughs> raise your hand. You <laughs> raise your hand. <laughs> All right, historical accuracy. So by that, uh, do you mean like archaeological corroboration with? what the Bible says. Yeah. So there's, there's certain historical claims that the Bible makes, and it's been verified by archaeological. Very good. Why do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Unity. And this is a little bit different kind of argument. So what you what you just brought together were like three things that conclude in unity. So you, you brought you you basically this argument in and of itself that then becomes one premise for yeah, yeah, exactly, right. I'm just trying to point that out though, right? You're like, it was written over fifteen hundred years, there were over forty different authors, and yet it has the same story and it it all holds together. That kind of unity over that amount of time, over that many different kinds of authors, at different points in history, to say that that's probable, <laughs> say, ah, it just happened to be that way, and that it's man-made. It's like, it's really unreasonable to do. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you can't find yeah more than one person right to agree on almost anything nowadays, this, and that's that's another argument, right? And uh, I've heard it called the the Richard the, the Nixon argument uh, about the Gospels or about the Gospel message, and it's like, uh, was it there were t so the Gospel has twelve disciples who made a claim that Jesus came back from the dead. And then they died for it. And so there's a couple explanations for that, right? They were liars. One explanation. Or, and there's a lot of explanations, right? But we'll just do two. 
They're liars or it's actually true. Now, the fact that they were willing to die for this, you know, this hoax means a lot. It holds a lot. Because when you compare it to Watergate, there were 12 <laughs> high officials who were trying to lie about something. It didn't last three weeks. <laughs> it's like they were not willing to suffer anything for that lie. And yet these men, they were, they were supposed to be lying about Jesus. And then they suffered horrible deaths and they changed their, their theology. Well, that's a different reason. But so like that's, that's what you're getting at though, right? That's the, the Nixon <laughs> uh, argument or whatever. Yeah, but the unity, right? The fact that so many people can write this over a large period of time, like that's just, it's unreasonable to think that it wasn't God superintending the Bible's creation. Unreasonable. <laughs> All right. Any other, any other reasons for why you believe the Bible is the word of God? Ah, okay. So, uh, let's see. How would I put that? The accuracy in which people copied, like the reverence with which they copied uh, text. Mm hmm Yeah. So there's, that's, that's a little bit different, right? That's kind of like a, a lot of people believe it. So maybe it's true. That's a little bit different. But I think what he's getting at is, is the, uh, the kinds of people who copied it down. Like they had very, very strict <laughs> copying methods. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll put, yeah, scholarship is it. Scholarship through the centuries is very strong. Um, uh, and then when these guys wrote about it. Oh, that's a really strong reason. It's kind of in here because we talked about the long period of time in which the Bible was, you know, was it took to complete the Bible. And in that time, there were prophecies written early and then fulfilled later. And there's not a really good explanation for this, except that God gave the prophecy early and then fulfilled it later. Now, what that's going to lead to is a bunch of scholars arguing about when a text actually came out. And, oh, all of, they're going to try and show that anything that has a prophecy in it was actually written later because then made it look like there was a prophecy that was fulfilled. Then that's when you get into all that scholarship stuff. Whatever. Cool. But this is a strong reason for believing that the Bible isn't just some book. It's not like any other book. The claim is that it's the word of God. And the reason that that claim is important is because what it says matters to every single person. It has authority. That's why having reasons for this claim is important. Provide reasons for this claim is to provide reasons, take it seriously, as an authority over your life. So people will argue against this claim very strongly. Very strongly. So this is just a demonstration of, you know, within our own way of thinking, what we're doing is, Building walls to support the roof. Now, a lot of times what people will do is they'll just give you a roof and then we'll start arguing about the roof. Like, well, really, see what those walls are. What are those walls? And so now I have a video for you. Because this guy, master. <laughs> and it's, it's, Really great. Um, so we'll watch this video real quick. It's only a minute. It's really quick. 
And so there's many universes out there. That's kind of the one. The mother and, universe. And, and, yes, and then... It has little progeny of the different universes. What on earth does that mean? Notice. <laughs> You already so the guy said there's many there's multi there's a there's a mother universe and it spits out baby universes. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna back this up. Here it is. There's and there are, yeah, and there are so many universes. That's the so here's the claim. And so there's many universes out there. That's kind of the one. The mother and, universe. And, and, yes, and then... Has little progeny of their different universes. What on earth does that mean? So, the guy makes the claim. There are many universes. That's the multiverse idea. First thing this guy does. What do you mean by that? Right? Like, what? Okay. It means there's a kind of bigger reality outside of the universe we see and know. What's the evidence that there's a bigger reality outside of this universe that we live in? That's the question. How did you reach that conclusion? What evidence do you have that there's more than one universe? You observed another universe? <laughs> you see that? We're not going to argue about, like, please. Give me more. <laughs> that doesn't, that's not reasonable at all. Right? But now the guy's in the hot seat. This guy's really good at, he goes, oh, that was a claim. What's your evidence? For? And he just repeated the claim back to him, basically word for word, the way the guy said it. So it's not like he's misrepresenting the guy's claim. Right? He just repeats it back and goes, what evidence do you have for? And then he repeats the claim back. Basically, word for word. <clears throat> there's, there are different models. Models? Yes. So because there's someone has, with a fertile imagination, come up with another model? Like, like, like the God hypothesis, yes. That's also just a model. No, it's not. Ah, so, now there was a back and forth. He goes, now there's multiple, now he's just going, there's different models, so there's different explanations for how this all got here. Right? There's the God hypothesis. That's one model. There's the multiverse hypothesis. That's another model. And they're the same. That was the claim. He's going to go, no, <laughs> they're not the same. But why are they not the same? This is where they're going to, yeah. It is based on my experience of reality, which is you don't get order and design by accident. This BMW is not a result of an explosion in a junkyard. Shakespeare's plays are not a result of an explosion over a computer or from monkeys tapping on the computer. You only get order and design, be it a building, a car, an article of clothing, if there's a rational mind involved. The fact that Jesus is God and so there's many universes out there. Come on. The fact that Jesus is... Yeah. So, so, did you notice what happened there? And it was like, a little bit of it was that it was edited out, right? So make it fit within a minute. But, but what he's doing there is exactly what Greg Kokel says to do. He's in a conversation with... The, now, this guy's open air preaching at a university and there's students and they're you know, going back and forth. It's probably not going to be your typical day-to-day -day thing, but it illustrated exactly what Greg Kokel's talking about. This guy said there were multiverses. Really? Do tell. <laughs> like, like, tell me more. What evidence do you have? And notice, he didn't give any evidence. All he did gave you a roof. And then he said, oh, where are your walls? And there weren't any. He had no reasons for believing. It was, yeah, there's just so many roofs. And this roof just appears to be designed. It just looks designed. But it's because there's an untold number of universes out there that didn't work. And this is, just happens to be the one that did work. Like, well, please tell me about this universe creating machine that you just invented in your head. There's no reason. There's no evidence for that. There isn't. I mean, what would count as evidence for another universe? 
how would you even right there's we make movies about this right because it's a fun idea to play like what <laughs> and but there are people who take this seriously and they're looking for evidences of a multiverse and you know they might theoretically yeah you know, it's it's the <laughs> it's any time travel movie that you've ever seen giant problems with <laughs> every single time travel movie you've ever seen right anyways so but I, what i wanted you to see in that video is uh the guy cliff asked for evidence for the guy's claim he, i gave a claim this is conclusion there's multiverses he asked for evidence and the guy had nothing he just went he just shifted the conversation to well there's there's different explanations there's different mo he said models there's different models for how this all got here or why there it looks designed and this multiverse hypothesis is one of those explanations but providing an alternate explanation is not the same as giving reasons for why that explanation is more probable than another he didn't give any reason and so when he shot back there's multiple models we have the God hypothesis, we have the multiverse hypothesis, and then he goes, and they're the same, or they're on the same level. Cliff goes, no, that claim doesn't hold any water because I have evidence for why I think the way I do. And then he gives the evidence. He goes, things that are designed require a rational mind. It's obvious that a BMW didn't come together by chance. And you get... It doesn't make any sense. If a junkyard explodes, it's not going to put itself together. It's too finely tuned for to actually work. You know, and maybe mechanics will argue over whether it's actually finely tuned or finely tuned <laughs> enough. But that's a different argument. But notice what he's doing there. He's putting the burden of proof on the guy who makes the claim. The guy makes the claim. It's like, cool. Tell me about it. So the person who makes the claim has the burden of proof. They need to give evidence, give reasons, give facts. And people should be able to provide reasons for important things that they believe to be true. So we use this tactic to get people to give reasons or evidence for their belief. <clears throat> so this is when anyone asserts an opinion, or sorry, advances an opinion, makes an assertion, makes a claim, or has a point of view. It's their job to defend it. Not your duty to prove them wrong. It's their duty to prove themselves right. So refuse to shoulder the burden of proof when you haven't made a claim. Now, if you make a claim, have reasons for your claims. That's where the conversation can keep going. But have some walls for your house. Have the reasons that support conclusion opinions are not arguments right alternate explanations just like that guy that little video demonstrated that's not an argument either he didn't provide an argument the argument has reasons to support a conclusion and if someone gives you uh yeah, if someone gives you an alternate explanation, they need to provide reasons for why that's more probable than the other explanation. We have just a couple of minutes. So, there are lots of explanations for, or one of the best arguments for Christianity being true is the minimal facts argument for the resurrection. It's basically there are historical facts that all historian all historians accept, and then it's okay. What explanation best explains these historical facts? So there was a death by crucifixion. Women find an empty tomb. His disciples had experiences that they believed were the risen Jesus. Then the disciples suddenly and sincerely became came to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead, despite every disposition to the contrary. Even some doubt it, right? And then, because of that belief, 
that Jesus was came back from the dead. They suffered violence and even died for that belief. That needs to be explained. Then they began preaching about the, the deity, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus soon after those events happened. And even the enemies of Jesus were converted. So James, his half-brother, didn't believe that Jesus was, was who he claimed to be until after the resurrection. And then Saul, or Paul, of Tarsus became a believer. All of those facts need to be explained. And there's lots of different explanations. I'll just hit a couple. But notice that some are be- <laughs> one is better than all the others, right? First, the resurrection is true. It's real. It actually happened within history. It's a historical fact. That's one explanation. That's our explanation, right? Then there's the swoon theory. Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He just swooned, and then they put him in a cool grave, and then he kind of woke up and then escaped. That's, a, that's an actual theory. It's pretty weak <laughs> to say that someone who was stabbed in his side and blood and water came out that he's still alive <laughs> and then move that giant stone. Like that doesn't explain all the facts. There's a twin theory, right? There's two bodies, not one. So now we have to invent hypothetical entities in order to explain away a simple explanation. The mass hallucination theory, right? Everybody was just hallucinating this whole thing. Huh? <laughs> Right, then there's the, the, oh, we just need to spiritualize it. So spiritual resurrection theory. That doesn't fit the empty tomb. Spiritual reality of the resurrection. You know, like all of the myths of old, you know, resurrecting God. No, it doesn't make sense why the disciples would suffer and die for a spiritual resurrection. And that's not what resurrection means. The word. (laughs) What does resurrection mean? That means you're dead, and then you come back to life. Come back. You stand up. It's right here. Physical reality. And it's like, oh, they went to the wrong tomb? Theory. But notice, if that's a claim, well, how do you know that they went to the wrong tomb? Please, provide evidence that, that you know that the women went to the wrong tomb. Especially since they're the ones that loved him dearly and knew exactly where he was. Like, they, they messed that up? It's unreasonable. Uh, the body was never put in the grave. It stole it away. Who gave that theory? Pharisees. Because the guards came back and they're like, ah, he's gone. And they're like, ooh. You tell everybody that the disciples came and stole his body away. Even though they put the guards in place to make sure that wouldn't happen. Then there's the conspiracy theory. Everyone just lied. That doesn't explain why they would suffer horrific deaths and change their theology. They were Jews. They had to modify their theology and then suffer the abuse of their own people and the Roman authorities. Why would they do that? They wouldn't. So the best explanation is that it actually happened. <clears throat> and there are other explanations, but they, they're not good. They don't fit all the facts. Okay, well, I'm going to stick with, uh, stick with my roof. Pretty comfy under here. Nice. So be aware that you don't have to, if the burden of proof is shifted to you, you don't have to answer because you didn't make a claim. Now, if you make a claim, provide reasons for it. But press the other person to make, uh, to explain why they believe what they believe. And then be humble. You might be talking to somebody and they know a lot about what they're talking about. And then they just like overwhelm you with a lot of stuff that maybe you've never even heard of or even considered. That can totally happen. At that point, you might be like, oh no, I'm in over my head. This is, ah, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Be humble and go, you know, this is a lot of new information. Like, can you say that again? I want to make sure I get this right. Write it down. Then, and then just go, I'm going to need time to think about that. And once you say that, you plead ignorance, and then 
What else do you have to say? Nothing. I, I you know, I'll just, I, I can't, I don't know what to say to that. Well, I guess I'll just have to think about it. That's it. Now you're out of the hot seat. Like, do you think you'd be able to do that? Like, ah, oh, I've never heard that before. I'll have to think about that. Oh, talk about something else. <laughs> or like, you know, how great the Matrix is. Like, once you say, yeah, once you say, let me think about that, you can go home and study it. And at a place where there's not as much pressure, you can think about it. And it's good. And it's also like, if you're in an ongoing conversation with somebody, a loved one, trying to share your faith with them, like you're showing them deep respect by honoring what they're saying. You're listening to them and taking it in and then also thinking about it and then providing reasons for why you believe what you believe or maybe why maybe their thinking is a little skewed and they, maybe they should change it. All of that is respectful. Take some time to think about it. All right, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for the sunshine. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to think on these things, and I pray it's a, an encouragement to your people. Lord, be with us as we go upstairs and, and worship you. Lord, may we offer a sacrifice of praise and Lord, glorify your name for being great. Lord, thank you for the resurrection and the truth of it. Lord, that it gives us hope to live lives that honor you. Lord, I pray you be with Pastor. Um, may he preach message that you've uh, given to him. And Lord, may our hearts be ready to receive.